Well, hi. Hi there. How are you? How's it going? I hope it's going well. Welcome to Crime Dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So that's what I talk about. If you like true crime and you want to feel better about your makeup skills, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and come hang out with me every Tuesday where I take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on my war paint. Happy end of the month. Yes, this is my last video uploaded for March. Uh, but before we get into that, I've got a uh, little super uh, exciting announcement. So uh, let's go ahead and get into that first. So yeah, I have an exciting announcement. Uh, I am actually an ambassador for Pink pearl jewelry. And uh, as you can see, and you'll see in the video throughout, I'm actually wearing some pieces uh, today. I've got the uh, Roman digital necklace on right here, which I just, I really love this design. It's so pretty and it's got like little Roman numerals around it. And uh, I also have this uh, rose flower bracelet, which I am in love with. Like not only is it super pretty, but it's like like a pole string so like you don't have to do a clasp so if you're like me and can't put jewelry on by yourself it is so awesome and not just that um i don't know about you but i have super sensitive skin which means i can't wear anything fake which sucks but uh, I have been wearing these pieces like all day yesterday and today and like, oh my God, this is like actual quality jewelry, like no irritation on my skin whatsoever. And yeah, so uh, I am an ambassador for them. I really like these pieces and I actually have a promo code to give you guys for 85% off. Yes, 85% off. All you have to do is put in the promo code Crystal Sky. That's Sky with an E, S K Y E. And yeah, you get 85% off of your uh, order. And yeah, thank you so much to Pink Pearl Jewelry for reaching out and letting me be an ambassador. If uh, you want to check out their Instagram, they are at Pink Pearl555. You should totally check them out. Their website's in their bio, and they're all always posting pictures of like their pieces and stuff. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, I am at crystal.sky, S-K-Y-E, 117. And yeah, I'm going to be posting stuff on there, like showing off the different pieces that I'm going to be getting because I am definitely getting some more. I'm very very happy with this and I'm usually not like a jewelry person and it's because like yeah my skin's super sensitive but uh yeah I love this stuff so yeah go ahead and uh check them out so yeah once again thank you so much to Pink Pearl Jewelry and uh yeah let's get on with today's case so yeah super super excited about uh being an ambassador and yeah um like I said uh, I'll be wearing uh one of the bracelets and uh their necklaces during the during the video and uh yeah also like i said before this is the last video for the month of march i have decided that months that happen to have five tuesdays in them i'm gonna go ahead and take the fifth tuesday off you know just to you know uh re relax you know recuperate get ahead on like some research and stuff um but yeah i will be right back here in april with uh, a whole month full of uh true crime cases cases. But uh, yeah, that's that's all the way in April. Let's get into today's case. All right, today's case. We are doing yet another serial killer. I know, I think this is like my fourth one or something. What can I say? These are the cases that I'm drawn to. Now, today's case, like I said, serial killer case. And I wanted to talk about it because it is just... It's pretty wild, all right? Uh, it is the case of Stephen Brian Pennell, who is the Route 40 killer. He is also Delaware's first serial killer. And as a Californian, I just got to say, uh, welcome to the club, Delaware. Um, yeah, sorry, it's kind of a crappy club to be in, so sorry. And yeah, I heard about this case, and... 
this guy is definitely one of those killers, very similar to, you know, like your Charlie Brandt types. He's just in enigma, all right? Like it just, there's no rhyme or reason as to why he did the things that he did. And it's just, it's wild. Those are the kind of cases that just, you know, stick with me and kind of creep me out. So yeah, I wanted to talk about it. So yeah, quick disclaimer before we start. Um, there is a lot of violence in today's case, uh, specifically violence against women. The victims in uh, today's case suffered very, very brutal torture and death. So we will be talking about that. So just be forewarned. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and get into Delaware's first serial killer. All right. So we're going to open up on November 29th, 1987. All right. And we're in Wilmington, Delaware. And a 23-year-old, Shirley Ann Ellis, she's walking along Route 40. Uh, Shirley is 23 years old, and she is a former sex worker, but uh, she is no longer a sex worker this night. Uh, she has actually decided to go back to school, and she's actually going to be a nurse. And she already has, like, her her nursing textbooks and everything, so, like, it's, it's really great. Now, Shirley, she's walking along Route 40, and she has a Thanksgiving platter that she is taking to an AIDS patient that she knows who is at Wilmington Hospital. Shirley lived with uh, her mother and stepfather. Her mother's name was Nancy, and her stepfather's name was Garney Miller. And they lived in Newark's Brookman Farms area neighborhood. And uh, Shirley had departed their home about 6.30 that evening to uh, walk to the hospital. Now, in this area of Delaware, during this time, if one did not have a car, um, people usually walked and or hitchhiked. And that is what Shirley did to the hospital for the 14-mile trip to the hospital. Uh, unclear if it was a 14-mile round trip or a 14-mile one-way. So she was headed towards the hospital. And uh, she did stop to buy some cigarettes and a rose uh, before she got there. And she did arrive at the hospital and was seen leaving about 7.30 p.m. that evening. And after that... She started the walk back home along Route 40, and a car pulled her over and uh, offered her a ride, which Shirley accepted. Around uh, 9.30 later that evening, so just a couple hours later, uh, a couple of teenagers, they're, they're winding down their Thanksgiving break by, you know, having, having some little alone time, you know, as, as teenagers do. And they pick the old Baltimore Pike Industrial Park, which is located right off of Route 40. And this is a pretty secluded place, so they decide, like, this is gonna, this is, this will be a nice little, like, make-out area, you know? Now, uh, as they turn on the road, the boyfriend's headlights on his car shine on what, at first, they think is, what do you think that they thought it was? A mannequin. Yes, I can't believe how many cases I've read where people thought it was a mannequin. I never, ever want to stumble upon a dead body. I never, ever want to experience that. That would just be so awful. So, yeah, they shine headlights on uh, what they think is a mannequin, but uh, in actuality, it was actually poor Shirley. She had been beaten and tortured to death. Uh, Shirley's body was uh, partially clothed. Her top was open and her bra had been cut down the middle and her breasts had been exposed. And uh, not just that, her nipples had been mutilated. Yeah, yeah, tortured and mutilated. Her pants were also pulled down and her legs had been spread open and her feet had been bound at the ankles. And black duct tape was actually still clung to her hair. There was also a uh, tool-like impression uh, on Shirley's stomach. The autopsy would later show that Shirley had been brutally beaten, mutilated, and tortured to death. Now, despite how her body was found, uh, the autopsy would also show that there was no sexual assault and no rape. Um, I guess silver lining, I guess. Shirley had actually been tortured with work tools. The killer had tied a ligature around her neck and then had repeatedly struck her in the head with a hammer. Now, there were no clues at all as to who could have done this. Like, Shirley had no connections to, like, you know, any shady characters or anything like that. And uh, as soon as police uh, ruled out uh, friends and family, the case pretty much went cold. Seven months later, 
On June 28th, 1988, Catherine DeMauro, she is also walking along Route 40. It is around 11.30 p.m. Catherine uh, was 31 years old, divorced, and she did have a history of arrest for sex work. It is unclear if she was working this night. So she's walking along Route 40, and uh, a stranger in a blue van offers her a ride, and uh, she accepts. Around 6.30 a.m. the next morning, uh, construction workers who were building, like, a housing track and, like, an apartment complex and stuff, they stumbled upon Catherine's body. And it was actually found about three miles from where Shirley's body had been found. Catherine, though, she was completely nude. Her ankles and wrists had been bound. And she also had black duct tape in her hair. And not just that, one of her breasts had deep black and blue and like purple bruising on it. And her nipples, like Shirley, had been brutally mutilated. Not just that, one of her nipples had actually been partially removed. Catherine was found lying on her back, uh, her body contorted. Her right leg was drawn underneath her with her foot touching her arm. Her shoulder-length brown hair was matted with blood, and uh, they found black duct tape uh, that was, like, attached to her scalp. Catherine's legs had uh, deep bruises on them, uh, which told investigators that she had tried to fight her killer. So she did go down fighting. Other than being uh, completely unclothed, it was just like Shirley's uh, death, except it was even like more so. Like the violence was increasing. There was like a deep bruising found on Catherine's uh, buttocks, which they theorized the killer had pounded her buttocks with a hammer. This bruising was not found on Shirley. So this told investigators that uh, the violence was increasing. Her nipples had been cut even deeper and mutilated even more than Shirley's. And like Shirley, uh, Catherine had been uh, bludgeoned in the head three times with a hammer. Only this time she was struck with such force that uh, the skull actually splintered and like went into her brain. It was that intense. So the violence was increasing. And just like uh, Shirley, they found that uh, the marks that uh, were used to mutilate their nipples were used were were used with a a, a side a, a side cutter, which was a type of like wire snipping pliers. This was like the tool like impression that they found on Shirley's stomach. They had indicated it was these type of wire snipping pliers, and that was what was used to mutilate their breasts. I know, I know, it's so terrible. And just like with Shirley, there was no sexual assault or rape on Catherine, but the violence was definitely increasing, but no sexual assault and no rape or anything like that. So obviously not a sexually motivated crime. Now, authorities, they immediately suspected that uh, whoever had killed Shirley had also killed Catherine. The, uh, the, the, the type of like torture and beatings they took, the specific damage done to their breasts and their nipples was just was so specific you know that like it was very very like unlikely that two separate killers just happened to kill these two women and just happened to give them the exact same kinds of like injuries right and yeah so investigators were like oh my gosh i think we have a serial killer on the loose delaware's first but uh, it wasn't all doom and gloom. There was actually a clue found on Catherine's body. Her body was covered in these uh, blue carpet fibers. And these blue carpet fibers would actually, uh, they will end up being super important. So uh, one week after Catherine's body is discovered, a task force is launched with the Delaware State Police and the Newcastle County Police. This task force had been put together in order to hunt the Route 40 killer. That is what they were calling this killer. Uh, the headquarters was uh, near the Newcastle County Airport. And uh, the task force boasted uh, over 60 uh, members slash officers. And for a time, it was actually Delaware's third largest uh, police force. And it boasted an unlimited budget. Uh, so the FBI had confirmed to Delaware authorities that they were, in fact, dealing with a serial killer. And that is why this task force had been formed. 
So the task force had met with the FBI's uh, Behavioral Science Unit located in Virginia. And yeah, there is where they had confirmed that, uh, yeah, they were dealing with a serial killer based on the information they had about Catherine and uh, Shirley's killers. And uh, not just that, the FBI was like, this guy is definitely increasing in violence and he is going to keep killing until he is caught. He is one of those. He's not going to have a cooling off period. Now, the FBI had also done a profile on the Route 40 killer and they said that he would be a white male between 25 and 35 years old, probably lived and or worked within a five mile radius of the kill sites. If uh, he was in a relationship, um, it would not be a healthy one. It would be quite toxic. It would not be happy, be happy and healthy. He would be driving a van or a vehicle that would be large enough uh, to be conducive to the killings because they were theorizing that he had killed his victims in his uh, van. He knew how to use tools and uh, would more than likely be working in the construction trade, either as a mason or a carpenter or an electrician. And the FBI profiled him, saying that this guy would be one of those hiding in plain sight. He would look like anyone else, which is, yeah, the creepiest kind, right? So, yeah, with uh, this information and the FBI's uh, confirmation that they were, in fact, dealing with a serial, serial killer, this task force had been formed, and this large undercover operation uh, was being uh, undertaken. So they were going to put a female officer and have her pose, work undercover, posing as a sex worker, and have her walk along Route 40 uh, in an attempt to lure the killer to them. The officer uh, chosen would engage, you know, with in flirty banner with potential Johns and try to get like some basic information out of them, you know, like name and, you know, where they lived and their job. And uh, any any guy that uh, kind of rubbed them the wrong way, uh, they would then uh, check them out. And that was the undercover operation that they were going to uh, launch. And of course, the female officer uh, would, of course, never enter any vehicle. So as the uh, authorities in the field launched that operation, uh, those in the lab started analyzing those blue carpet fibers that were found on Catherine's body. So great, right? They've uh, got a task force. They're launching. They're going to catch this guy, right? Well, as we know with uh, a lot of these cases, especially with serial killers, even with the police on the case and, and hunting them, there are still victims that fall prey to them, right? And that's what happened in this case, unfortunately. So on August 22nd, 1988, uh, another victim, a 27-year-old sex worker named Margaret Lynn Finner would disappear. Uh, Margaret was from Montclair. Her mother's name was Blanche and her stepfather's name was Robert Barlow. And Robert had actually been Margaret's father since she was four years old when he married Blanche. Margaret had some brothers and actually two young sons of her own. Now, poor Margaret. She had her struggles. Uh, she was a recovering cocaine addict, but it seemed like she had gotten a handle on her addiction, possibly. Um... She had gone to rehab. She had found a job working as a cashier where she worked long, long hours. She picked up any shift that she could. And she had managed to remove her two sons from foster care and had moved in with her mother and stepfather. And yeah, things uh, seemed to be on the up and up, right? Well, unfortunately... Unfortunately, unbeknownst to anyone, Margaret had actually went back to doing sex work on the side. She had really fallen behind on bills and just needed all the extra cash she could find, which I just thought was really sad that, you know, she was working, you know, you know, she was probably working over 40 hours a week. She was working every shift that she could pick up. Um, it's just kind of sad that, you know, she couldn't make enough money to pay her bills. And so that's why she went back to sex work, you know. So the night she disappeared, uh, she actually took her sons to get some pizza and then they all watched some Disney movies that night and then she tucked them into bed and then she told her parents that she was uh, going out for a bit and would be back later and she left the house in a yellow shirt and jeans and some tennis shoes and she headed towards Route 40 to work and uh, that would be the last time that uh, Margaret or any of her family would uh, see her again which is just so sad I mean at least she had, like, a nice, you know, last night with her sons. I guess that's something. I just, I thought that was really sad. 
Now, Margaret's friend later that night saw her getting in to a blue Ford panel van with round headlights. And the driver was a white male. Uh, but uh, Margaret's friend couldn't remember like any distinguishing features, you know. And uh, when Margaret didn't come home and her family had reported her missing, this friend had relayed that information to them. And uh, three months later, on November 12th, uh, Catherine, um, Catherine, Margaret's body was found. It was found near the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal by a deer hunter. Her remains were largely skeletal, though, and uh, due to the advanced state of, of decomposition that her remains were in, no official cause of death could be determined. On September 10th, so a little over two weeks, after Margaret disappeared, another woman would disappear. This time it would be 26-year-old Kathleen Ann Meyer, and she was from uh, Brookman Farms, the same neighborhood as Shirley, and she was last seen walking along Route 40. Kathleen's father had been an engineer and her mother had been a homemaker, and Kathleen herself was a manager at a rental car company. Now, Kathleen lived with her boyfriend, and this night, on September 10th, uh, her and her boyfriend got into an argument, and he struck her. I know, I know. Don't, don't ever strike anyone, all right? Don't ever put your hand on someone else. But he struck her and actually bloodied her nose. So, Kathleen... Whoops, I just threw my brush. <laughs> so Kathleen uh, decided to leave. She decided to leave and go on a walk. And so she walked along Route 40. And someone in a blue van offered her a ride and Kathleen accepted it. Now, when Kathleen didn't come home the next day, her boyfriend had reported her missing. And of course, at this time when Kathleen has gone missing, as we know, the task force has been in full swing, right? The undercover operations going on. So like the cops are out looking for the Route 40 killer. And as such, the only lead they had was this blue Ford van. So so, of course, all of the law enforcement in the area, they were aware to keep an eye on literally any blue van, particularly a Ford van that uh, they saw. And that evening, an off-duty police officer, he saw a woman with shoulder-length brown hair and a bloody nose get into a blue van. And since he was a cop and he knew, you know, what was going on, he decided to write down the license plate of this van. Unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, I could not find any uh, further information other than uh, for whatever reason, this police officer did not share the information in time. He waited till much, much later to share this information. And uh, Kathleen was actually never seen her again. Um, her body has actually never been found. And uh, her family has actually refused like any and all press and publicity uh, surrounding her case, uh, sometimes even refusing to uh, cooperate with authorities because it just, you know, it really hit them hard. Now, uh, I was talking about the task force, right? And we know like the undercover operations underway. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I told you what the undercover operation was going to be, right? Well, they had found their undercover female officer, you know, the one that would pose as a sex worker and walk along Route 40. They uh, found their undercover officer in 23-year-old Newcastle County Police Officer Renee Lano. And she now goes by Renee Tashner. And uh, she had actually just graduated the academy like four months prior to this. So can you imagine talking about getting out of the frying pan and into the fire? Like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine that. So yeah, Officer Tasner, uh, she's walking along Route 40. And on September 14th, 1988, so just a few days after Kathleen has disappeared, uh, Officer Tasner, you know, she's walking along Route 40 doing her thing when she notices a blue Ford panel van with round headlights driving past. Now, uh, Officer Tasner evidently had a lot of men, like, driving past and wanting to talk to her. Um, apparently, she would have been a very successful sex worker, okay? At one point, there was a line of six or seven cars just waiting to talk to her. <laughs> In fact, um, an owner of a diner actually came out uh, and asked her to, like, move her little operation outside of his parking lot because it was disrupting his business. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, she was quite popular, you know. And so, yeah, she sees this uh, blue this blue Ford panel van driving past, and she notices that he would drive past, right? Drive down a little further, make a Yui, and then drive past her again in the opposite direction. And she estimates that he did this about mm, 
like seven times in about 20 minutes. Now, um, of course, she's in constant contact with her fellow officers, right? She's wearing a wire and stuff. And so she tells them about this, quote, weird guy driving past. And so she gives them uh, the license plate. Now, uh, in order to talk to this guy further and see if they could, like, lure him, you know, they decided to uh, drop Officer Tashner off at a more secluded area, you know, that was known for uh, sex workers. And at around 11.30 p.m. that evening, the blue van, it made an appearance. It actually pulled over on the shoulder of the road right in front of Officer Tashner. And a white, dark-haired, heavyset man motioned for her to come to the passenger side. And so, uh, Officer Tasner, she decides, you know, she gets ready to put on her, uh, her undercover persona, which is Jackie, who's a stoned, aloof partier, you know, so she approaches him. Now, when Officer Tasner, um, talked to Johns, like I said, she was supposed to try to get, like, some basic information out of him, right? And, like, those that were fishy, they would, you know, her, the, her fellow cops would, like, kind of do background checks on and stuff. Now, Officer Tasner has said that, uh, most of the men who stopped to try to, you know, proposition her for sex, they were, you know, they were usually like happy and trying to woo her, you know, trying to be all charismatic and stuff. But, um, this man in the blue van, Officer Tashner said that, uh, he was, he was like cold. He was kind of cold and kind of distant. Um, it was kind of hard to hold a conversation with him. And he seemed to like, stare through you, you know, just kind of stare. And he seemed kind of sullen, you know, and just kind of like creeped her out. And uh, her whole, her whole interaction with him uh, lasted about 10 minutes. And she said like, yeah, it was difficult to hold even that 10 minute conversation with him. Uh, in that 10 minutes, she did get him to admit that he was 34 years old and he worked as an electrician. Now, uh, she made to be like really interested in his van and uh, in so doing, got him to turn on the interior light. And that is when Officer Tashner sees blue carpet lining the interior. And uh, of course, this is very, very interesting. And uh, in her, like, flirty banter, she manages to rub her hand on the carpet and, uh, in the process, gathering some carpet fibers. And at that point, that is when the man tells her to, quote, get in. And uh, she declines, you know, saying that uh, she was, uh, she was good. She was, a, she was a little stoned from partying that night, you know. Uh, she instead asked him about his van, you know. She tried to be all interested in his van. And he said that he had bought it about six weeks prior. And that uh, he used the van for work and that the blue carpet had already been installed when he bought it. Again, he uh, tells her to get in and she says that she is, quote, too high for an encounter. And at that point, the man drives off. Obviously, after this encounter, um, Officer Tashner and her fellow officers, they're, they're thinking this guy might be their man. And so, Officer Tashner and another detective, Detective Hedrick, went ahead and tailed this man for the rest of the evening. And as they did, they ran the license plate number off the van and found that the man had lied about his age and name, but not his occupation. The van was registered to 30-year-old Stephen Brian Pennell, a Delaware electrician uh, who had no criminal record. Now, who is Stephen Brian Pennell? Let's, let's get a little bit into him. Who is this guy that the, the cops are looking at? So... Stephen Brian Pennell was born November 22nd, 1957 in Glasgow, Delaware. His parents were William and Elaine Pennell, and Stephen also had a younger sister who was about six years younger than him. And the Pennell family, they resided in Wilmington, Delaware. William was a tax accountant at Wilmington Trust, and Elaine was a homemaker, and she would later work at St. Francis Hospital's Business Center, and she was also a dead mother for Stephen's Cub Scout pack, so she was like an active, an active homemaker. When Stephen was seven years old, the family moved to an apartment, and uh, their next-door neighbor was a, a man named Harry Meneliski, and he was a police officer. Now, Stephen really adored uh, Officer Maniliski. He would always go over there and, like, you know, mow his lawn and do stuff for him and always ask him about his police work and stuff. Uh, now, Stephen would end up failing the uh, first grade. And for the first four years of his education, he was actually at Catholic school at Wilmington's St. Anthony of Padua Catholic Church. And uh, right after fourth grade, that is when his parents uh, enroll him into public school, and he attends Oak Grove Elementary. 
And in the ninth grade, Stephen's parents returned him back to Catholic school where he attended St. Mark's High School. And this was located near uh, Pike Creek. Now, in high school, the fact that Stephen was six foot five and 300 pounds earned him the nickname, quote, Gentle Giant. He was like a quiet, nice guy. Um, he kind of seemed to float around from click to click, never really settling into one social group, you know. Um, it is said that he dated some, but never had like a steady girlfriend or anything. And uh, the only, only extracurriculars that Stephen took in high school was wrestling. However, due to his uh, size and stature, he wasn't very good, and so he ended up dropping out midway through his second season. Stephen graduated high school in 1976, and he had aspirations of being a police officer. And he studied criminology for two semesters at Brandywine College, which is no longer a thing, and applied to the Wilmington Police Department's cadet program. However, he couldn't pass the physical aptitude test, and he actually told uh, one of his childhood friends, Ken Sanders, quote, I'm too fat, which is just like, dude, just, just go lose, just go lose some weight and like apply again. But like, Stephen does not try to become a police officer again. And I just don't get it. It's just like, dude, just go lose a few pounds. In 1978, uh, Stephen got a job at Elsmere Dry Goods as a stock boy. And the next year, 1979, when he's at a bar in Jersey with some friends, Stephen meets his future wife. Her name was Vera Kathy Huber. She also worked at Elsmere Dry Goods, was five years older than Stephen, and had a daughter from a previous marriage. And uh, the friendship grew, and they became a couple, and one thing led to another. And by 1981, Stephen and Vera were living together. Now, Stephen's parents, uh, for whatever reason, did not take kindly to this relationship. They were very against Stephen and Vera's relationship, and uh, I couldn't find any reason like why they didn't like Vera so much like I don't know maybe because they were like stuffy Catholics maybe like the fact that she was older than him and divorced and had a kid like I I don't know maybe, maybe that was it but like yeah they were very against this relationship and this actually put a strain on their relationship with Stephen so the same year he moved in with Vera in 1981 would also be Stephen's first minor brush with the law when he was arrested for burglary and criminal mischief for breaking into a tobacco shop and uh, trying to steal a box of coins and some pornography. Stephen ended up pleading guilty. I couldn't find the information as to what, uh, if any time he served or like fines or something. But uh, I, I don't, if he did serve any time, it was hardly any because later in that fall of that same year, 1981, he actually enrolled in Delaware's Technical College, Delaware Technical Community College. He specifically went to the Stanton campus. At first, he majored in food service management, but then he changed it to electronics, which is quite the shift. I'm not sure what uh, what happened there. So Stephen was hired as an apprentice for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local Union 313, but in 1984, for unspecified reasons... See, sometimes I'm talking and I don't uh, really realize what I'm doing. But yeah, in 1984, uh, Stephen is expelled from the Brotherhood, from the Union, um, for unspecified reasons. Could not find out why he was expelled. But uh, Stephen did manage to still find work, though. And in 1987, he managed to earn his Delaware Master Limited Electrician's License. Uh, and this qualified to be uh, him to be one of only 2,400 people in the state of Delaware who was authorized to wire up homes. And uh, at this point, uh, Stephen and Vera were living together in a mobile home at Glasgow Pines Trailer Court with uh, Vera's daughter from her previous marriage. And uh, Stephen and Vera had two children of their own. Now, a uh, friend said that even though Stephen was an intimidating looking man, remember we said he was like six foot five and like 300 pounds, so pretty big um he was described as a quote gentle teddy bear that he was just you know super sweet uh his friend ken you know the one that he said uh, that he told was he was uh too fat to get into the police academy that was like one of his few like lasting childhood uh friends and he said steven was just yeah just a sweet guy that like he like 
animal, uh, cruelty to animals really bothered him. Like, uh, one time he refused to euthanize a hamster that couldn't be saved by a vet. He would go duck hunting, but could never bring himself to pull the trigger. And he had a cat that he absolutely adored and loved named Cupcake. But, uh, according to neighbors, it seems that this kindness maybe didn't extend to humans. Um, because, uh, they reported hearing and seeing Stephen constantly verbally abuse his wife and children and constantly yelling. But, uh, yeah, it seems like he was sort of an enigma, though, you know? Um, because, yeah, so on the one hand, friends were saying, like, oh, he was this gentle teddy bear, this gentle giant, you know, and he loved animals. But then you have neighbors that said, like, you know, they could hear him screaming and cussing and verbally abusing, like, Vera and the kids. But these same neighbors also admit that, like, Stephen played, like, the role of Santa Claus during Christmas time. And, like, one time he even specifically went to a neighbor's house and dress up as Santa Claus for that neighbor's kid. And he would also, like, give rides to the kids and stuff like that. So, it I don't know, it's really, really weird. Like, oh, and also, the neighbors also reported seeing Steven play, like, baseball and basketball with his kids. So, really weird. Guy seems like an enigma. Like, on the one hand, it seems like he's kind of, like, abusive. And has a temper. And then on the other, he seems kind of like a normal guy. It's just really weird. Really weird. His stepdaughter even said that uh, her and Steven would have like father-daughter talks. Like you know, about life and boys and stuff. So yeah, dude, just just weird. Just like a, a, a weird enigma. Steven also worked as a uh, part-time bouncer at a nightclub in Wilmington called George's Next Door. Although, um, according to one customer, though Stephen loved to, like, you know, show off his son and was just very amiable, um, he didn't really command much respect. He just sort of played the role of the bouncer. Um, they said that they saw Stephen get knocked to the ground, like, flat out, um, trying to break up a fight once. So, like, he didn't really command much respect. He may have looked intimidating, but, uh, he didn't really command that much respect, you know. Uh, Stephen also seemed to have a problem keeping steady work. So even though he had his electrician's license and could, like, wire up homes, um, for whatever reason, he could not maintain a job. And they would last about six months. His longest job lasted almost a year. So not quite sure, uh, what that was about. But yeah, he could not hold steady work. And he was also uh, run up the family's credit cards, which, of course, would uh, increase their debt. And this put a strain on the marriage with Vera. And uh, him and Vera would have lots of arguments. And some of these arguments would turn violent. At least on one occasion, uh, Stephen did break Vera's arm. But like with most domestic violence, it was never reported. Now, shortly before Thanksgiving in 1986, uh, Stephen's already rocky relationship with his parents just boiled over. So they must have been at least amicable for all those years. Uh, maybe because they just at least wanted to see their grandchildren, you know. So apparently Stephen's mother was, um, I guess, like criticizing the way he was like disciplining his children. I guess she said, quote, I guess I'll have to spank you if you don't and make you go to bed if you don't stop doing that to the children. I couldn't find any context behind this. Um, so not exactly sure. Um, just based on that quote, though, it almost seems like mom is sticking up for the kids, you know? So I'm not sure what happened, but whatever, like, was the cause of that comment after that night in Thanksgiving in 86, Stephen never speaks to his parents again. Yeah. And then in the following year, Vera's mother passes away and Stephen and Vera tried to buy her mother's house. Um, not sure what happened. Um, just that Stephen said, quote, because of a fault of mine, we lost the house. So not sure. Now, uh, yeah, things are going a little, they're a little rocky for Stephen right now, you know, drowning in debt. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, they lost Vera's mother's house. They've got dead and he just can't keep a job. And it seemed that Stephen's uh, only escape was his prized possession, his blue Ford panel van. Stephen had bought this van June 3rd, 1988, and it had a red, white, and blue interior. It had been purposely decorated that way for the bicentennial that had come and gone a few years prior. And uh, Stephen took great pride in his van. He uh, had every tool that he had, because he was also very knowledgeable about his craft. He had every tool 
that he had in his van, in its place, like each thing in its own place. And yeah, he took really good care of it. Now, Stephen described himself as an insomniac, and uh, he would actually, after a fight with Vera, would at, or when he couldn't sleep, would actually go out into his uh, Ford van and drive around. And then uh, sometimes he'd come home in the middle of the night and just sleep on the couch while Vera slept in the bedroom. And then sometimes just sleep for a couple hours, wake up and go out in his van again. Um, or sometimes he would go out in the wee morning, morning uh, hours, uh, again, prowling in his van. On September 18th, 1988, so that was Stephen, by the way. So that was Stephen. That was uh, this guy in the blue Ford van that had pulled over, who Officer Tashner had talked to. And that's who Stephen was. So on uh, September 18th, 1988, so just a few days after uh, Officer Tashner's encounter with Stephen, another victim uh, would be taken at the hands of the Route 40 killer. This time it would be 22-year-old Michelle Gordon. Michelle uh, was from Newcastle, and she was born in uh, 1966 and actually born in England and had emigrated to the United States when she was four years old. Her mother was uh, Marlene Sim, and she had nicknamed her daughter Shelly. Michelle also had a little brother named Robert, and she was about five years older than him. And uh, it is said that she looked after Robert as if uh, he were her own child. Uh, Michelle really loved animals, and she was described as that type of girl who was just waiting for Prince Charming, you know, to come sweep her off her feet. And she completed up to the ninth grade of Glasgow High School uh, before she dropped out. And when she dropped out in 1981, uh, this seems to be when uh, a lot of her troubles started. Uh, Michelle struggled with addiction, and she was arrested multiple times on drug-related offenses. She uh, fell in with a bad, a bad crowd, uh, was often homeless, and she had actually turned to sex work in order to support her habit. And uh, like many without a vehicle in that area, Michelle hitchhiked to get around. She had last been seen leaving a tavern near the motel she frequented when they refused to sell her alcohol. She was later seen accepting a six-pack from a man and later getting into a blue Ford panel van. And uh, Michelle's nude, mutilated, and beaten body would actually wash up on the banks of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal on September 20th. So she was only missing for a couple days before her body was found. It was found by a uh, dunk truck, dunk, dump, Jesus, dump truck operator with the Army Corps of Engineers. My lord, I cannot talk. Unlike what the other bodies found, though, uh, Michelle's body didn't have uh, ligature wounds, like uh, marks. And she also uh, didn't have blows to the head, though she had been, like, tortured and beaten like all the other women. And uh, this violence was, you guessed it, even more than uh, than had been done to Christine. Um, again, the killer was escalating and escalating with each kill. Uh, her buttocks was ferociously beaten with a hammer. Her left nipple was completely missing, and there were long knife cuts in her legs. And they did find evidence that she had been bound. Now, the medical examiner, examiner actually found uh, cocaine in her system, and uh, they say that uh, her heart was actually incapable of withstanding the, like, shock of being beaten, and... That is actually, like, what killed her and why she wasn't strangled and beaten to death like the other ones. So another interesting thing to note is, um, so the night that Officer Tashner, you know, gathered those carpet fibers, remember they, like, followed, um, this, this man, Stephen, around. Now, um, that evening they saw Stephen pick up another woman and take her to a convenience store b before dropping her off at a hotel. And uh, the officer's later description of the uh, woman they saw Stephen pick up and drop off was near identical to Michelle. So yeah, they followed him. They saw him drop her off and then they followed him all the way home that night. And so they, sur you know, they were doing surveillance on him. And when all the lights in the house went out, they assumed that, uh, you know, the family went to bed for the evening. And so they actually drove off. However... However, remember, Stephen gets up in the middle of the night because he's a prowler. Uh, Stephen had actually gotten up in the middle of the night and went prowling out in his van after the cops had left. And uh, the day Michelle's body was found, investigators who were you know, still following Stephen around, they followed him to a pet boy's where he had all four of his tires replaced. And after he left, the officers, of course, 
swarmed in was like we're gonna need those tires and uh they had actually been thrown into a bin along with like 26 other tires so they had to sift through that and find steven's tires because they wanted to see if they matched tire tracks that were found near christine's body so on september 24th so just a few days after all of this this is where the investigation and the case really ramps up So September 24th, investigators, they match those blue carpet fibers that Officer Tashner had grabbed. They match them to the fibers found on Christine's body. So they've got a match. And this enables them to get a search warrant. They had also matched two of the tires they had seized from Stephen. They had also found matching tire tracks to the ones found near Christine's body. So, yeah, all of this enabled them to get a search warrant. Now, as all the warrants are being signed and, you know, all of the T's are being crossed and I's being dotted and all that, officers are, of course, still tailing Stephen because he's definitely suspicious at this point. And uh, so they're tailing him. Now, apparently, Stephen drives really erratically, and this enabled the cops to pull him over. Now, I'm not sure what they pulled him over for. I'm not sure what the shenanigans were. All I know is that so an officer, uh, a car with two officers pulled him over. One officer drove Stephen to the courthouse. I I don't know what they pulled him over for. But uh, another officer then drove Stephen's van to a parking lot where other investigators were waiting and they searched the van and collected evidence. They also placed a hidden microphone in the van. They had actually gotten a warrant specifically for that, like just for that specifically. They then uh, drove the van to the White House, where, uh, to the White House, (laughs) to the courthouse. (laughs) They drove Stephen's van to the courthouse where he was none the wiser as what just happened. And then they let him go on his way. Now, you might be asking, like, why they wouldn't arrest Stephen after matching the carpet fibers, but I think they just really wanted to build their case, you know? Like, I think they just really wanted to have as much evidence as possible, which is why they were, you know, bugging him and, like, searching his vehicle and stuff. On October 23rd, uh, so he's been bugged about a month, Stephen finally discovers that microphone, and he rips it out and starts cleaning out his van. Uh, the jig is up. The jig is up. And uh, later that same evening, officers got warrants to search uh, not just the van some more, but Stephen's house and another car he owned and any other property that he had. And uh, they raided Stephen's home and, yeah, searched it. Uh, They also searched a couple sheds that were found on his property as well. They also took uh, some bodily fluids and some hair samples from Stephen. In the attic, investigators found stashed away a bunch of S&M and bondage material and sex toys that had all been stashed away. There was also a uh, VCR in the attic, and there was actually a pornography tape uh, loaded up in the VCR called uh, The Taming of Rebecca. And uh, investigators were shocked to see that the scene that was queued up on the VCR depicted a a man forcefully piercing a woman's nipple with a pin. Yeah. In uh, Stephen's van, uh, authorities found a torture kit that had pliers, a whip, handcuffs, needles, knives, and restraints that were found underneath one of the couches inside the van. Uh, They also found some stained foam padding from underneath the carpet that they believed was stained with blood. And uh, later, uh, lab reports would uh, find that they found hair, blood, and skin belonging to Shirley and Christine in Stephen's van. Now, uh, at this point, still not sure why they have not arrested Stephen. Um, but at this point, maybe this was like in the process of when they're like analyzing everything that they collected. But um, after they raid Stephen's home and, you know, take collect all this evidence, they start brazenly monitoring him, you know, because the jig is up and they start brazenly monitoring him um, to the point where it's kind of weird. Where, like, officers, including Officer Tashner, actually end up, like, building a rapport with, like, Stephen and his children. Like, one time she sat next to him at, like, a Moody Blues concert. Um, Another time she was saying that, like, her, like, his kids would, like, run up to her and show them stuff that they did at school. And, like, one time one of them came up to her and asked to donate to a school fundraiser. So, like, that just seems really bizarre and weird to me. This whole situation seems really bizarre and weird. I'm not... 
I'm not sure, but yeah, that's what happened. Um, it got to a point where Steven just started telling the officers what he was going to do that day. You know, just come out and be like, all right, guys, this is what I'm planning on doing. Um, but Steven did finally get uh, a lawyer about midway through November. He hired, uh, he hired Eugene J. Marr Jr. to be his attorney. And like I said, he hired him about like in the middle of November. Falsies are giving me the worst time. Finally, an arrest warrant was issued for Stephen on November 29th, 1988. He was in custody and charged with the murders of Shirley, Catherine, and Michelle. He uh, exercised his right to remain silent, didn't say anything. Meanwhile, uh, as he was in custody, investigators were trying to track down the first vehicle that he owned before the van because they thought Shirley might have been killed in it, but uh, they were never able to track it down. Now, uh, prior to his trial, his defense attorney, of course, doing his job, uh, was trying to get a bunch of evidence thrown out, right? Uh, Such as the DNA evidence that they found, arguing that uh, DNA evidence was not generally accepted among the scientific community, right? Uh, Remember, this is... uh Stephen's trial ultimately takes place in 1989, so, like, this whole process takes place in 1988, 1989, so just, uh, you know... Bear that in mind. So yeah, he was trying to get the DNA evidence thrown out because it wasn't yet uh, generally accepted by the scientific community. He tried getting the carpet fiber evidence thrown out, arguing that Officer Tashner did not have the authority to seize them. A Superior Court judge disagreed, though, and allowed all of the prosecution's evidence uh, forward, which was a big win for the prosecution. And this was a huge win for the prosecution because uh, a lot of their case uh, rested on uh, these blue carpet fibers. And uh, if a Superior Court judge had ruled that, yeah, um, Officer Tasner didn't have the authority to seize them, almost all of the evidence that the prosecution had gathered since that point would have been thrown out under the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. Because basically, it was when those carpet fibers matched the ones that Officer Tasner had grabbed, they matched the ones found on Catherine's body. That is what had enabled them to get all the search warrants and the subsequent search warrants. So if a judge had ruled that those carpet fibers were inadmissible, pretty much all of the evidence the prosecution had gathered would have been thrown out the window, would have been thrown out the window. And uh, the only thing they would have been left with was that uh, DNA evidence. Now, I said, Stephen's trial takes place in 1989. All right. So at this point, the use of DNA evidence was still completely new. And in fact, only 19 states in the U.S. at this point in time had even ruled DNA evidence admissible in court. And no, Delaware was not one of those 19 states. In fact, Stevens' case would mark the first criminal case in the state of Delaware that would use DNA evidence. Now, despite the carpet fibers the DNA evidence. Despite that, it is said that uh, the biggest thing to play against Stephen at his trial was Stephen himself. So even though he had, you know, dressed in a suit and tie and looked very much, you know, more like a lawyer than like a defendant, his demeanor was, to put it mildly, like cold, you know? Uh, He was described as coming off as, quote, cold and aloof. When he admitted to paying for sex with uh, Christine and Michelle, the way he talked about them apparently was very demeaning, like they were less than human or something. And he even denied knowing Shirley at all. And when his attorney had him on the stand to testify, yeah, he called Stephen himself to the stand. It really worked against him. So his lawyer wanted him to testify how Christine's blood and hair had found their way into his van. And uh, Stephen said that uh, he had paid Christine for sex, which is how her hair got in there, and that um, she was menstruating, and that's how her blood got her, found its way into his van. Okay. He testified that he picked her up and uh, paid her $25 for oral sex, and uh, when he dropped her off, he even joked that she, quote, gave me $10 back. Oh, yes, yes, because it is such an honor, you know to uh, have oral sex with Stephen, that she actually gave him money back. Yeah, he actually made this joke. And as you can guess, the jury was appalled, absolutely appalled. So yeah, his whole demeanor was just not good. Um, His eyes were described as just being like very cold and dark. Um, Even his own attorney described his eyes 
as being like shark eyes, you know, just very cold, very, just, just a very not nice person, um, particularly the way he referred to the women in his case. Um, apparently, he was just very demeaning. Apparently, at one point, a picture of the three women was shown, um, their autopsy pictures, and uh, the jurors were horrified and actually, you know, turned their gaze away. But Stephen, it is said... When the photos came up, Stephen was all of a sudden wrapped with attention, and he, like, perked right up and paid attention to everything being said. Yeah. Stephen's mother, who had shown up to every day of the trial, um, she actually walked out at that point when they showed those those pictures. She walked out and didn't come back that day. Um, although she would still maintain her son's innocence all throughout the trial. Yeah, I don't – look, man, like, I get, like, okay, maybe unconditional love, love your – like, your – kids no matter what but like you need to at least admit what they did like come on come on like he's obviously guilty steven's trial lasted eight weeks and despite steven's demeanor despite the carpet fibers despite the dna evidence the jury still took eight days which was the longest at that point in delaware state history to come up with a verdict on November 23rd, 1989, on Thanksgiving Day, the jury found Stephen Brian Pennell guilty of the murders of Shirley and Christine, but they were deadlocked on the murder of Michelle. And when it was time for the sentencing, the jury was again deadlocked on the death penalty. And so the judge sentenced Stephen to two life terms on November 28th. Now, his defense attorney, of course, filed all of the usual appeals, trying to get this thrown out, that thrown out, you know how it goes. And uh, instead, instead of uh, getting an appeal or stuff getting thrown out, on July 8th, 1991, Stephen was indicted on two more murders. I know, isn't that sweet? They indicted Stephen with the murders of Kathleen and Michelle again, and this was based on new blood evidence that they had discovered. A DNA test that was on a blood stain that was found in the van was tested, and it came back to be Kathleen's. Now, in response to these two new charges, Stephen asked if he could proceed uh, without an attorney, which of course was granted because that was his right. Now, Stephen's next moves would shock everyone. Shock everyone. Stephen pled no contest to the two new murder charges in October and asked the Superior Court to sentence him to death. Stephen wanted to be put to death. Now, it is worth mentioning that throughout all of this, Stephen always maintained his innocence. He always maintained his innocence, never confessed to anything, never admitted to anything. He said that he just wanted to spare his family, quote, further heartache. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. If you're actually innocent, yeah, that makes sense. Let's spare my fa my family heartache by, like, killing myself. A hearing was then held to determine if Stephen should be put to death or not. And uh, Stephen, at this hearing, made an argument for his own execution. He said, among other things, quote, the law was developed from one book, and it is that book I quote from. In Numbers chapter 35, verse 30, whoever kills a person, the person shall be put to death. And he quoted like other Bible verses, and it all kind of like had the same message. And on Halloween in 1991, the Superior Court granted Stephen his request, and he was given the death penalty. Now, in Delaware, all death penalty cases are automatically appealed, and throughout all of this process, Stephen is still trying to get himself put to death. He's trying to argue against being alive. He even attempted suicide twice while in prison, one time by drinking shampoo and another time by slitting his wrists. And on February 11th, 1992, Stephen appeared before the Supreme Court, the five-judge panel, to uh, argue for his own death. Now, what was even weirder still is Stephen spoke like in the third person, you know, like it was really weird. He still never confessed to anything. He spoke as if he was like a lawyer arguing to put a criminal to death or something. He said, quote, the perpetrator must have sensed a pleasure in the killings since he did not commit just one, but continued in the same depraved manner on the others. This pleasure 
is evident. And yeah, it's just really weird the way he was speaking. Like he he himself never confessed to anything. He spoke in the third person. Just very bizarre. Very bizarre. Now, Deputy Deputy Attorney General Richard E. Fairbanks Jr., he was uh, on the state side and it was his job to argue to put Stephen to death, despite the fact that Stephen was arguing to put Stephen to death. Now, even though uh, Fairbanks himself was personally opposed to the death penalty, he still argued vehemently for Stephen's death. Um, he was just very passionate. Um, it said some of the judges even thought that he might cry, like he was just arguing very passionately. And uh, what's even stranger is that throughout this whole hearing, this whole process, not a single judge asked a single question, which is pretty unheard of, which is really unheard of. The court then unanimously agreed to grant Stephen's request, and his execution was scheduled for March 14th, 1992. Now, Stephen, he seemed satisfied with this outcome, and though this is what he wanted, there were still those who were fighting against his death. Uh, two men, who Stephen had never even met before, tried to file appeals on her on his behalf, but they were dismissed with because they didn't have any merit. Uh, Vera, Stephen's own wife, tried to stay his execution. She had asked the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU of Delaware, to put a stay in for Stephen's ex execution, which they did. And in fact, a board member of the ACLU, um, he was a Widener University law professor named Lawrence Hammermish. He even agreed to be Stephen's lawyer. Uh, even though he had never handled a criminal case before. Hammermish tried to argue to the courts that a psychological evaluation that had been given to Stephen during his first trial, um, the one that proved that he was sane and competent to stand trial, Hammermish was trying to argue that that evaluation was not nearly thorough enough and that a new one needed to be done. But a court uh, rejected his arguments and the execution uh, was still set forth. Shortly before his scheduled death, uh, Stephen contacted his prior defense attorney, uh, Eugene Marr, and uh, asked him to stand with him as he did a press conference. He said he was, quote, afraid of saying something stupid and wanted his former lawyer by his side. Now, everyone at this press conference thought like, oh my God, okay, he's going to die soon and he's finally going to spill the beans. He's finally going to admit it and maybe he'll tell us where like Kathleen's body is, you know, like maybe he's finally going to confess. And so there was like a lot of like hubbub about this press conference. Conference. But it ended up being very anticlimactic. Stephen maintained his innocence again and again said that he wanted to die to spare his family heartache. He did reveal what he was going to have for his last meal, though. He decided it was going to be steak, crab cakes, corn on the cob, and lemon meringue pie. But on the actual day of his execution, he changed it to a double order of French toast with orange juice and coffee, which I'm not going to lie, both of those meals sound delicious. And on March 14th, 1992, Stephen Brian Pennell was put to death at the Delaware Correctional Center and is now called the James T. Vaughn Correctional Center. He was pronounced dead at 9.49 a.m. And he was the first man to be executed in Delaware in 46 years at that point. And uh, before his death, he had no last words. He did not leave any answers as to why he did the things that he did, what he was thinking, or or what. Um, in 2016, the Delaware Supreme Court actually ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. And yeah, real, real quick before we end the case, I just thought this... People are wild, man. They, they really are wild. So, so get this, all right? So um, several years after the trial, many, many, many years after the trial, Vera, she calls up one Detective Joseph A. Sawiski, all right? And he had been one of the detectives on the case, okay? And get this. So she calls up Detective Swiski and asks if she can have Stephen's blue Ford panel van back. Yeah. So the prosecution had taken Stephen's van. They had actually dismantled the interior and reassembled it inside the courtroom to use as like a, a as an exhibit of evidence. And uh, the van had just been sitting in like a police compound somewhere for all these many years. And yeah, Vera wanted to know if she could have the van back. She wanted it back because one of her kids was getting to be driving age and she wanted them to have a car. And Detective Swiski, like, straight up asks her, you know, quote, 
you want the car that was used in these murders that we proved and showed at trial so your kid can drive it. And apparently Vera just replied nonchalantly like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought that was super wild. Can you imagine? Like, I wonder if her kid ended up driving that van around. Like, that's terrible. Like, surely her kid had to have known what it was, right? Like, isn't that wild? She wanted the murder van back. When they had proved that he had killed women in that van. Like, that's just wild to me. That's wild to me. Yeah, this whole case is wild to me. Um, like I said, this these are the kinds of killers that just really, really creep me out. Because it's just, it's just like, why? There, there's no rhyme or reason, you know? There's, there's, there's no logic to it, you know? And yeah, that was the uh, strange case of Stephen Brian Pennell, the Route 40 killer, Delaware's first serial killer. And yeah, super, super anxious to know what you all think of this case. What do you think of Vera trying to get back that van at the end? I'm sorry, am I out of line for thinking that's just inappropriate? And just like, what are you thinking? Like, is that just me? Like, I would I would love to know. And yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Uh, thank you so much to Pink Pearl Jewels for letting me be an ambassador. Um, again, yeah, I'll put my code and all the info in the description box down below so you can get 85% off of your order. And yeah, like I said, at the beginning of this video, this is my last video for the month of March. So uh, I hope you enjoy uh, these two weeks. I will see you right back here in April for a wild case. All right, a wild one. I may actually have to shorten it because I really don't want to do a two-parter again because that was a lot. So yeah, I will see you back here in two weeks for another crime dive. And until then, I hope you stay safe, stay happy out there. Remember, just don't be a dick. Just just be a decent human out there. It's really not that hard to do, all right? And you never know, like, you could totally make someone's day just by being a decent person, all right? All righty, I will see you next month in April for another Crime Dive. Bye-bye.